said, and I quote, nigga don't let the sun set on your black behind. I went through all of that. Um, my high school, we had torn and tattered books. We never got new books. The desks were all scratched up. Our science uh, and biology uh, teachers um, had makeshift equipment. But you know, in spite of all of that, I succeeded because those teachers who came from the majority from HBCUs used to tell us as students, even though there's tape over the words, you can see it, and the same books you're reading are the same books the white students across town are reading. They said excellence without excuse. We went through that. And you know what, my parents and the elders in the community taught us that those were sick people, not us. So even going through all of those challenges, going through the segregated pieces, and when I graduated from high school, all of the white schools offered me scholarships to play sports. I missed by 0.2 percentage points in being the, the valedictorian of my class because we competed academically more than we did athletically. And my closest friend beat me by 0.2 percent, uh, 0.2 percentage points to be the valedictorian, but I was happy. And so, but that segregated time for me was a drive for me to work harder. And so, going through that and the fact that even to still today, I own six businesses, about 800 employees, 96% of all of my clients are white, and but I still give up at least one third of everything I earn goes back to the black community. I have scholarships. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's more like it. Welcome everyone uh, to this particular program. Uh, the whole idea of the National Black College uh, Alumni Hall of Fame Legacy Lecture Series is a great deal to digest because it's so phenomenal. Uh, it represents something very distinct, unusual, very, very important, and that's magnetic in our community. And when you think about the comprehensiveness of what this whole lecture series stands for, for the National Black College or National Alumni Hall of Fame, we can circle that together and think about its leader and it's the outstanding dynamic, uh, Mr. Tommy Dodge. Uh, Mr. Dodge is just absolutely phenomenal. I tell students all the time that when you come to a college or university, it's not just passing classes. When you come to the Institute of Higher Learning, you don't just come to complete those classes and go through college. When it's a real fertile experience, it goes through you. There are things that you are provided at those institutions that's not in the books. And this is a premier example of where you are being introduced firsthand with some of the most outstanding and knowledgeable individuals on this planet. And this is intellectual capital that's very, very difficult to harness. And we've been able at Atlanta Metro to bring it all together. And these things are under the tutelage and leadership, certainly, of Mr. Deutsch. Let me tell you a little about him. He is an unusual guy, a phenomenal man, and a gentleman who's a proud graduate of Fort Valley State University and Clark Atlanta University. Uh, he's a member of Omega Sci-Fi fraternity. 
Uh, he is chairman and chief executive officer of TWD, Thomas, Thomas W. Dorch Incorporated, a six business conglomerate based here in Atlanta. He serves on the boards of several colleges and universities uh, and other national organizations, including Chair Emeritus of 100 Black Men of America. I need to just tell you two AMSC students that he has very deep roots at this institution because he served with Andy Young's former, his, his first wife, who's now deceased. He served with her for many years and he chaired the Atlanta Metropolitan College Foundation for many, many years, which helps to do things to help this institution and students. He is also a much sought after speaker and a national and international level type of guy who everybody tries to get. He is a recipient of far more awards than I have time to mention and honors. Uh, and these things celebrate his unselfish community service and philanthropic uh, efforts. He's philanthropic in a multiplicity of ways. And uh, you will see and hear things about him all the time. But he is a minor type of guy when it comes to his own appearance. He doesn't like a lot of accolades, but he's the type of guy who is so humble. When I say minor, he humbles himself. But this is a giant, clearly, who has been harnessed for this occasion. He has guest appearances on numerous shows, including the Oprah Winfrey Show. Uh, you have here two distinguished judges who are here on the panel with him. No doubt, uh, two of the most outstanding judges, again, on this planet, not just in this city. And uh, he has so many accolades. And he is the, just an humble type of guy who calls him a servant with a deep love and a passion for the existence and preservation of historically black colleges and universities. I've noticed this firsthand for a multiplicity of years. He sent four or five of his nephews to this institution and a niece, and they were my students. And they were outstanding students. And he himself called and asked me to mentor them and they became students in the social sciences division when I was a division chair. I could say many, many things about this guy, but again, this is something that you will get no place else. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Thomas W. Dorch, the man of the hour. Let's give it up to, to one of the greatest presidents. We inducted him into the National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame. Was it last year, Dr. Mugaha? He was inducted into the National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame for his leadership. I was on, that was uh, Coach Mike Woodson. Uh, one of the things I've been doing is my grandsons love basketball, and so I committed to take them to the NBA All-Star game. So Coach was calling me, tell me he had the tickets arranged, and so, I had to take that hot phone call, so, because uh, my grandsons would never forgive me if I don't deliver on my commitment. Um, what I'm going to do, I mean, first, it is a pleasure to be back here. My 20 years as chair of the foundation board was, uh, for me, a, a great opportunity and experience. But I can't say anything before I introduce a great man in this audience, because uh, he helped me get the Hall of Fame launched 34 years ago. But more importantly, he's been one of the giants who's made a difference for historical black colleges and universities in this state. Please join me in saluting Dr. Elridge McMillan. Dr. McMillan, please stand. <laughs> Dr. McMillan. He was the long, he still stands as the longest tenured member of the Georgia Board of Regents, former chairman of the Georgia Board of Regents, and when Dr. McMillan was on that board, uh, historically black colleges and universities had nothing to worry about because he was a giant that stood toe to toe to make sure our institutions stayed open, to make sure our institutions had the resources, and when I was starting the Hall of Fame, before we got our nonprofit 
status. I went to him and he let the Hall of Fame be a fund of the Southern Education Foundation that he was president of until we got our nonprofit status. But Dr. McMillan's impact, impacted so many uh, people, but you got a giant on this campus who uh, was in a, um, a, in, a scholar in residence here on this campus, and you, you have one of the best in the nation. So I, I couldn't say anything without giving uh, the due to Dr. Elridge McMillan. If it weren't for him, a number of our historical black colleges would have been closed in the state and education and access for our students and students of color would not have been what it is. So Dr. McMillan wanted to do that. Um, before the, the lady in charge and the real uh, mistress of ceremonies, I want to ask now if uh, Brendan Butler, uh, if he will just come. Um, you know, when you get around, you got presidents. I'm just going to simply say thank you for letting me come to your house. And folks, here's the president of the Student Government Association, Brandon Butler. Good morning, President Magaha, panelists, National Black College Alumni, Hall of Fame Foundation representatives, guests, faculty, staff, students, and friends of Atlanta Metropolitan State College. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Legacy Lecture Series and Atlanta Metropolitan State College. I'm delighted to join you this morning in a program that is designed to expand the knowledge and experiences of AMSC students by exposing us to the triumphs of a diverse group of African-American scholars and professionals. Today's panelists will share their collective wisdom, knowledge, and experiences with us. The series focuses on the development of professional character, ethical standards, entrepreneurship, and leadership skills that will empower the next generation of future leaders to face the challenges of an ever-changing world and workplace. It is important to have these business and community leaders share their wisdom with AMSC students, for they have already experienced, this, experienced the struggles that we have yet to face. We thank you for sharing your time and talents with us today. I would like to um, introduce Pamela Cross. Pamela Cross serves as Vice President and Philanthropic Specialist for Wells Fargo Philanthropic Services within the private bank. Wells Fargo Philanthropic Services helps charitable individuals, families, and nonprofit organizations work towards unique goals by providing specialized advisory services. Ms. Cross is a friend and advisor to the Atlanta Metropolitan State College family as well. Wells Fargo is a major presenting sponsor of the Hall of Fame's Legacy Lecture Series. I will bring to you Ms. Pamela Cross to bring sponsor remarks. Good morning. Good morning. You know what? I don't know why I'm a little nervous. I don't know if I'm nervous or if it's, it's, it's the energy that's in the room or I'm a little emotional. I think it's a little bit of all of that. So, and I'll tell you why in just a second. So I want to first um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as Brandon shared, as said, I'm Pamela Cross, Senior Vice President for uh, Wells Fargo and the philanthropic group, uh, which is located in our private bank. But more than that, um, I'm also an Atlanta Metropolitan College Foundation board member. And what's most near and dear to me is that I'm a 1986 graduate from Atlanta Metropolitan State College. <laughs> so on behalf of all of us at Wells Fargo, I want to welcome all of you to today's National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame Legacy Lecture Series. At Wells Fargo, we know that when we invest in communities we serve, we win, and the communities win. We also know that we need to do everything we can to prepare today's students to be tomorrow's business leaders. As a result, more than five years ago, we partnered with the National Black College Hall of Fame to launch the Legacy Lecture Series to position students for leadership roles in society through education, mentorship, and entrepreneurship. This series is presented on various historical black college and university campus throughout the academic year. This partnership is provided by our Wells Fargo supplier, 
diversity team. This team works to ensure that diverse owned businesses, including African American owned enterprises, are integrated into our sourcing and procurement processes. Additionally, the supplier diversity team invests over 1 million annually in diverse supplier to business development, including the legacy lecture series, the 100 black men of America, and many more. We continue to focus on growth in every aspect. Now, as you might know, these speeches are written for us. So the last line says to thank Dr. Magaha, who I sincerely love. He is a phenomenal leader, and I consider myself to be honored to be able to serve on the college's board. It is very near and dear to my heart. My speech says that I'm supposed to thank you for having me on the campus, but really I'm at home, so I can't be invited to my own home. And so with that, I close with saying that I'm truly honored to stand before you and I look forward to what you're going to receive today. And although I'm a few years older, not your mom, I could be your cool aunt, <laughs> but I know that you're going to receive phenomenal information, and I can't wait to be able to connect with each and every one of you. So thank you for having us. The... Um First, I want to make sure you understand there are a couple seats on the front row here, too. Um, you got tickets today. There will be a join at the end of the session. You must be present to win. We're giving away um, book scholarships today. And in addition to that, uh, there are a little bit, um, some will start around 500, 300, and down. But there will be plenty of scholarships. And having been a student, I understand every penny counts, but you must be present to win. That will be done at the end of the session. The other important thing to, um, to really, uh, again, emphasize, and I'll make the commitment now, we will come back again next year because this college is consistent, the participation. We want you to understand when the Q&A time comes, we want to hear from you because this is interactive, but um, Dr. Magaha, as I said, his students here at Atlanta Metropolitan State College, they show up and they show out. And when you keep doing that, we'll keep coming back. So with that, let me get right to um, my, my other responsibility. I want to thank Wells Fargo. They've been our presenting sponsor since we started the Legacy Lecture Series, and we're all over the country. Uh, Delta Airlines and Georgia Pacific Foundation are co-sponsored, but Wells Fargo has been the presenting sponsor, and they put their money where their, where their hearts and commitments are. So they've been engaged in multiple things in our community, and I want to thank them. Now I want to introduce the um, task mistress, the judge, the jury, and everything else. And as I said, I've got two judges, and I don't, get, I don't mess with I don't mess with them. They said, tell me you need to do it. I just go do it and get it over with. Sometimes it may cost me something out of my pockets, but I'd rather pay out of my pocket than to pay any other way I would have to pay. <laughs> but folks, let me just bring to you again. She was the first African-American general counsel for any governor in Georgia and in the country. She, uh, again, was a former judge. She's an ordained minister. She's a grandmother who loves. She has a wonderful partner who they work and grow and understand the family structure. Um, she, many, well, if you've watched, and some of you may not have been watching because you were playing video games, but she uh, had the show, the Judge Penny Show, and was seen with, by millions of audiences. But what I can tell you, her commitment as she's developed um, a national conference that holds up and promotes womanhood. Uh, anywhere there is injustice, she's there and ready to make a difference, form a prosecutor. She's been a little bit of everything. But the one thing I can tell you, she is a great friend. She's one who fights for justice for all and has been a phenomenal part of our Hall of Fame team. Please join me in welcoming your mistress of ceremony for this session, Judge Penny Brown Reynolds. <laughs>
Good morning. What an opportunity. A lot of times, if we don't tell you what this is, you may not truly understand what this is. When you are in the presence of excellence and greatness, you ought to sit up straight and you ought to feel it. And you ought to know it the minute. And it's a spirit. Because when it's mediocrity, you know it. But when there's something that's at a different level, when you can feel that people are here because they care, you're not just a number. That's what this whole event represents. And the theme for it is defining who you are. And so we're going to get to a lot of topics. What I want to do, because we do want to hear from you, is before we do anything, and I know you can't say enough about the leadership, because many of us speak across this country. Dr. Magaha is not just an administrator, but he is an intellectual. And he is one who really cares. I couldn't even get from one building to the next before he's telling me yet another idea of how he can bless you in some way. Let's give honor where honor is due. Stand to your feet and honor the president, Dr. Gary Magaha of the Atlanta Metropolitan State College and University. Okay, so I want you all to pay attention. We're not going to call the bailiffs in on you all <laughs> because nobody made you be here because you know that there's something about defining you because at the end of the day, all we want to do is matter. He bought the best and the brightest. So what we're going to do is let them introduce themselves briefly, and then I want them to put in their mind and we'll come back to you and I'll call on you. Everybody may not answer every question because they've given me certain topics that we want to cover. But it's that definition of finding who you are. How did they come to that point of doing that? So let's start with the introductions, my dear. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Anta Njai. I am a graduating senior at Spelman College, political science major with a double minor in economics and journalism. I serve as the 82nd Miss Maroon and White from Morehouse College, and I humbly serve as the 33rd Miss NBCA Hall of Fame. Good morning. Good morning. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. But recognize he, who she who's, he or she who's greatest among you should be a servant. My name is Hank Stewart. I'm a poet, a writer, an author, and I look forward to talking with you a little bit more. Good morning. Um, I'm Glenda Hatchett. You probably know me best as Judge Hatchett from years on television. Yeah! <laughs> Um, but most imp my most important role in my life is, is to be a mother and now a grandmother. Um, my daughter tragically died, um, unfortunately, unnecessarily, um, recently. And so it just puts things in perspective. And I'm thrilled to be here and grateful to be here because it is our privilege, and I speak for all of us, to pour into you today and for you in turn to pour into us. Good afternoon, my name is Kiana Jackson. I'm a program manager with Wells Fargo. I create financial literacy programs for medium to large businesses across North Metro Atlanta. I do have two daughters and I'm passionate about economic empowerment and economic equality. And my goal is to make a difference so that when my daughter becomes 18, 25, 35, that certain doors are not being closed in their faces, mm -hmm. that they have the different opportunities that we're up here fighting for and to hopefully equip you with. When I say okay, you say all right, okay? All right. Okay. All right. My name is Stevie Bags Jr. And I want to emphasize Jr. because I got to separate myself from Pop sometimes, you know. <laughs> Nonetheless, very, very, very thankful to be here. I want you guys to do one thing. Just hug someone next to you real quick and say spread love. Let's do that.
I said a person. See, y'all don't even follow directions. Dr. Magaha, we got to get them right. So the reason why we did that is because we had to continue to change the vibration and the frequency and the chi and the energy and the spirit and the anointing in this place. Because once we recognize who we are, we know who we're not. So I want to tell you, young people, today that you're going to get super put on your natural so that you can find out how to do supernatural ability in everything that you do in life. With this panel right here of servants and leaders, we recognize that we can only be leaders. A true leader cannot be a leader unless they can create other leaders, not followers. Excellent. So with that being said, my name is Stevie Baggs Jr. And you can follow me on all social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook. Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook. But, I, but more importantly, I want you to put your face in a book. I want you to find out how to write a check and learn how to balance a checkbook. This is the kind of information you're going to get today because money alone ain't power and education alone ain't power, but information is power. And if you get good information, you have good power. Thank you. Let's give our panel a round of applause. You are in for a treat. So what we will do is I will present a question. I will call on one person, and then I'm going to ask two of the other panelists to interject, and then we'll go to another question. A lot of times, all you need for someone to do is speak a word. If I say that you have the ability to be great, although you don't feel like you can, but if someone who is great says that you can, doesn't it change something? Doc, uh, Judge Glenda Hatchett is so phenomenal that there are just no words for me to say it. But I could not say it and appreciate who she is unless I could appreciate who I am. Because a lot of us cannot look up to someone because we believe if we're shining, right, the only way for us to shine is for us to put somebody else down, right? Instead of wanting to be as close to greatness as we can, because when Judge Hatchet shines, I'm going to get some of that shine on me too, right? And so Judge Hatchet, all of us have a story. Everybody has one. The people who don't get it, run away from that story instead of embracing it. When we're asking defining who you are, that's the series we're dealing with. To come to the point of being the phenomenal Judge Hatchet, how did you get to the point of defining who you are and who are you? Um, thank you, my sister, um, and we, as brothers and sisters, and I say that without regard to race or class or culture, that we have to uplift each other. My defining moment really came for me on my knees the first week I was in my courtroom. Mm -hmm. With an eight-year-old child, and I'll give you the 90-second the version of that story, who had been abandoned by his mother and he came into court and he was just standing there trembling and I literally had been on the bench for one week. I'd been sworn in on October 1st, this was October 8th. And she had left him and said I'll be back to get him and she never came back. This is October 8th. She left him on July 23rd. And so I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. Um, there was nothing in my education um, although I am a woman of deep, deep faith, um, I didn't know legally what to do. So I instinctively just stood up and took off my robe and came down to him. And the bailiff said, oh, judge, you can't come down here. I said, you better get out of my way. Because, mm. see, I had been a mama a whole lot longer than I had been a judge. Mm. And I took him in my arms. And it was at that hearing, that moment, that defining moment, where my purpose and my passion mm. intersected. That I had been a lawyer for Delta Airlines for years before I became a judge. I was the highest ranking woman of any color, black, Hispanic, any, any color, worldwide. And I had never lost a case. Mm. But this is where my life changed. 
because it was this where I found my purpose of mm -hmm. feeling like mm -hmm. I had to make a difference because if I could get my hands on children mm -hmm. and maybe we wouldn't see them mm -hmm. in a system when they were 15, 25, 35, 45. Mm -hmm. And so I'm grateful, I'm grateful for that defining moment. But I will add, and I'm through, is that you cannot be clear about defining yourself until you are very clear about why you are here. Mm. And I don't get it twisted. I've been on television now for almost 20 years, but I know I am here because of God's grace and his mercy and because I stand on the shoulders of mighty, mighty generations who sacrifice for me to be in here today. I do not get it twisted. Mm. Mm. Miles Monroe once said, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but the greatest tragedy in life is to be given life and not know why you're living. Mm. I'm going to say that again. The greatest tragedy in life is not death, but the greatest tragedy in life is to be given life and not know why you're living. Mark Twain said, the two greatest days in your life is the day you were born and the day you realize why you were born. I think there's three, Judge. I think the day you were born, the day you were born again, and the day you realize why you were born again. But on November, the, November the 7, 1991, Judge, I found out why I was here. I was a manager at UPS working third shift. I was making more money than my mom and my dad put together. And I, I came home one day, uh, one morning, I was working third shift. I came home that morning around 7 o'clock in the morning. And I, you know, pedaled around the house. And I went to sleep around 10, got up around, it, was, it had to be around 5. Turned on the news around 6 o'clock because I had to go to a meeting. And, I, and the news was the news. Murder, carjacking, inflation, the typical things you see in the news. The sports, the weather came on and it was floods and tornadoes in the Midwest. I'm a sports junkie. And the sports came on, Tommy. And that was the day that Magic Johnson declared he was HIV positive. I had never in my life seen the news so bad. I started doodling on a sheet of paper and the very first poem God ever blessed me was the piece that's called, Can You Hear Me? Mm. And the poem was real simple. Lord, there's times when nothing is going right. Lord, there's times I can't find anything good to talk about. Lord, there's times when I cry. I wonder, do you hear me, Lord? This times I've fallen, and I wonder, did you see me? Can you hear me, Lord? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just give me a sign, and very softly, he spoke to my heart. He told me about Calvary, and this is what he said. He said, Hank, do you know they slapped me across my face because I heard your cry? It pierced me in my side because I heard your cry. They spit on me because I heard your cry. And I died on a Friday because I heard your cry, but I rose on a Sunday because I heard your cry. Now, my child, you have it all simply because I heard your cry. November the 7th is when I heard his cry. I heard his voice. I would challenge each and every one of you all to listen to, God, listen to God's voice. You will find your leadership. And if you, uh, if you call yourself a leader and look back and nobody's following you, you're simply taking a walk. <laughs> one more of our panelists. So what I learned in life is that you have defining moments when either one or two things happen, an amazing event where you're just happy beyond control or when you have a traumatic experience. Yeah. Those are two things that make a difference. And for me, I was 15 and I was sitting in a courtroom, not because I misbehaved, let me clarify, <laughs> but I was sitting in a courtroom and they were determining whether I was gonna be ward of the state at 15 and go into foster mm -hmm. care or whether my father who was in a different state had the opportunity as a second parent um, due to abusive situations in my house to come and get me. So I'm sitting in this room, like a conference room, not in a physical courtroom, but a, a conference room with the judge, with my appointed attorney, because I'm 15, with the independent living coordinator and my dad was on conference call. And I remember like it was yesterday sitting in that room and they said, Mr. Canton, you know, we have your daughter here, and in short, before she becomes ward of the state, do you want the opportunity to come and get her? Mm -hmm. Now, he couldn't see me in the room, and he said, no, mm -hmm. she can become ward of the state. And my biggest fear at the moment was, wow. who's going to take care of me mm -hmm. if my mom is acting crazy? <laughs> You know, and my dad just said without seeing me, he doesn't, he still to this day doesn't know I was in that room and I heard that because he tells me a different version of the story, but I was there. And I thought, well, who's going to take care of me? 
And it was at that moment said, you're going to take care of you, girl. That's who's going to take care of you. And it has not been easy. But when you talk about defining who you are, am I still learning in my late 30s? Absolutely, I'm still learning. I'm still learning whether I can wear my hair straight or curly, depending on the event. And who's going to look at me and say, is she being black powered today? Or, you know, should we, <laughs> should we tread lightly? What is she going to say? But that's where I became different, a different person, because I had to. And you're going to have that option in life where you're going to be faced with the I have to make a decision. And that decision that you make is going to guide the steps for the rest of your life and potentially make the difference in somebody else's life, but most important, make the difference in yours so you have the opportunity to pave the way, whether it's for you, for your neighbor, for your kids, for your grandmother, or to go back and make that difference for your parents because they didn't have the opportunity and maybe that's why they made some of the decisions that they made. Mm, excellent. Anybody here have something inside of you that if you thought, if I could just get a chance, if I could just get a break, if I was just put in the right situation, I know that I could make it. Anybody, let me see your hands. Anybody here that just, just thinking, if I could just get that chance, that opportunity. We're going to go with the rest of the three, starting with Mr. Dorch. When people know that they've had a hard life, they don't have anybody on their side, but all they know, if they could just get a chance. Right? You know what I'm saying. You feel it in your spirit if somebody could just know what I really am. How then do you convince people like you? Or how would you recommend to them? What do you do when they have something inside of them and they don't even know what to do to get it known? Isn't that a good question? All right. Y'all answer that question for us. First, um, to convince me, you got to convince yourself. If you come to me telling me why everybody else and they didn't do this and why you can't make it because of discrimination, you can't make it because they don't want you to, to be successful, then you really shouldn't be talking to me. Mm. You need to do more talking to yourself because I've said over the decades, if I could find out who they was, that powerful person called they that convinced you you can't do anything, I want to be a partner with they. The, the important thing is to understand, if you come to me or anybody, um, we've gone through challenges. I grew up doing segregation. I was in the last segregated high school in my, in my city. But the adults taught us, is they, we were not the ones that the problem, it was the sick people who discriminated against us, but it was excellence without excuse. If you come to me and you know what you want to do, I'll help you find out how to get there, but you gotta know first is what you wanna do. My, my mantra is I give out before I give up. Mm -hmm. Because people will tell you no just to see how serious you are and whether you have sustainability or the staying power that you're gonna keep coming. And so for me, you, you need to come with your ideas. You also need to be prepared for your sweat equity that you gotta put into it. And you got to show me you've done something other than coming to me with an idea and you expect me to go do the, the legwork and do the research for you. That's for everybody. But going to anybody in our communities, any of the folks here, and a lot of the people I work in my network, if you're serious, they'll help you find a way. Because we're where we are today because others who helped us. That's why in, in the program, I, as National Chair 100 Black Men of America, we have 135,000 young people in our mentoring program, and most of them come from at-risk communities. But the important thing that we pour into them and to you, where you were born is just where you were born, but where you go is up to you and where you're going. And, and so all of that said, if you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can't, you can't. It's simply a matter of what you believe. And so saying that is that any of you in this room that want to make it, first start with yourselves. Create partnerships. Create the kind of team that can work with you. As I told my son, he's in here, he's my youngest son. Hey, he is 32, Thomas. If he'd been my first child, he probably would be the only child I had. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Florida a &M University graduate, but as I said to Trey, it's the old African proverbs that I leave you with. When they know who your friends are, they know who you are. You're judged by the company you keep. 
And if everyone around you are spilling into you negative thoughts, you need to get rid of them. Yeah. You need people who are going to motivate you and push you to where you want to be. And those are the kind of people I don't mind helping. And there are adults that still talk about, I can't make it because of slavery and discrimination and racism or sexism. But people, it's been here. It's going to be here. And so you either learn how you go over it, around it, or go straight through it. But it's those people who are willing and determined to succeed are going to make it. And all of us, and there are just millions of people in this country and from our community, will do whatever we can for you because I'm where I am because I had a ton of people working for me. So that's my, that's my little bit I give you. If you want me to help you, you got to be prepared to help yourself. Wow. Um, that was phenomenal, Mr. Dorch. I hope I'm not redundant in any way. Um, to answer your question, Judge, I just I, I have to read Becoming by Michelle Obama from my Black Women in Leadership course this semester. Um, but I think it's a great read, not only for black women, but for black men as well, for anybody, for everybody. In part one of the book, she says, failure is a feeling long before it's an actual result. Mm. And I, I don't know, like, when we talk about opportunity and we talk about chances, like a lot of, of my peers, if not friends of mine, like people that don't know me, they ask me how I've gotten a lot of the opportunities that I've gotten. But that's because I've never been afraid to force myself into a setting. Mm. Um, even like I, I think extracurricular wise, but I also think even down to my studies, like the fact that I'm pursuing a journalism minor on the campus of Morehouse. Spelman doesn't offer that. So I had to jump over a, a series of hurdles to prioritize that core sequence to the administrators on Spelman's campus. I was told no over five times, but just because somebody tells you no doesn't mean that you're supposed to say okay. And I think that's a lot easier said than done. You have to genuinely look knows in the face and say, I'm going to keep going forward regardless. Even prepping for this pageant, to have this sash, I, I, in this position, this, to be able to be amongst this family, I got everything for that pageant the very day before. Practiced my oratory on the car ride to the competition because the administrators on my campus didn't feel that I was prepared for it, but I did not take no for an answer. I've done service work in Ghana and in South Africa, told no by, by financial coordinators for both programs because I didn't have all the funds by the designated date, but I knew that I was going to get the funds. You have to. I, to Mr. Dorch's point, you have to believe it before anybody else can believe it. It, it does start with, with your setting. It starts also with you refining yourself. Um, if you want to be regarded as a professional in certain spaces or regarded as somebody that's worthy of certain things, you got to talk that talk and walk that walk. You have to, to buff your social media. You have to buff yourself as a person, spirit, as spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Vacate or void all of the things out of you that are not not for me, I know that I got rid of everything that is not of God. And I've also gotten rid of everything that is not in alignment with my goals and what I see myself becoming in the next five years. There's no way possible that you can touch those goals if you're still in, in lock and key with things that are bad or in lock and key with things that don't speak life into those things. And we, we, I see every, like a lot of people are nodding their heads, but I, I hope that you all take my words because I'm a lot closer to you all's age. <laughs> so I know how difficult it is to truthfully stay away from things that we shouldn't be around. As far as people, it's kind of hard to get around, get away from certain people on campus. Like we know how that goes. You have to move intentionally and deliberately though. You only have 24 hours in a day. You have five in class. Let's take the next four not to just be kicking it out on campus with the same people who kicking it out on campus. Let's go into a room and lock into our goals. Mm -hmm. Let's go and lock into our studies. Let's go and lock into other opportunities that are sitting on the internet. We just have to tap into them. That are sitting in books, we just have to go buy them. Um, stationary as we are, we forget that a lot of these things are at our fingertips. We just have to touch them. That's my piece. That's, uh, that's some great advice, Queen. Uh, before I get started, I, I have a question for you guys. Can you control your heartbeat? No. Oh, you can? For how long? It's because it's called an autonomic nervous system, meaning it's going to beat automatically without your discretion. Or can you control your breathing to where I'm talking about you don't need oxygen anymore? See what I'm saying? If you fall off this building, does gravity care about your religion, your race, your bank account? 
So I'm giving you these pictures to make sure you recognize that you need to start talking about things that are inarguable and ineffable. I can argue about my past. I can argue about me being growing up in the hood. I can argue about me being an only NFL player to play on 11 teams in 10 years. I can argue about being an actor and religion and television and politics. I can argue about all of that. But when you start talking inarguability, ineffability, that's when you have power. Because nobody can take that away from you. So what we want you guys to recognize is that once you change your thinking, you can change your ideas. Once you change your ideas, you change your actions. The only reason people call you sheep is because you're allowing them. I'm not a sheep. Who want to be a sheep but a fool? A sheep is the only animal with that much meat that can't protect itself. But when you become a ram, now you got a problem. So what I want, what I'm here to do is change the way you think. You don't got to think like me. I just want you to think. Because when you start thinking, now people can't do nothing with you. The universe has to get out of your way. You're in school to get education. And I told you, education alone ain't power. You can have $13 million in the bank, 13 degrees on your wall, or 13 bricks in your attic. If you don't have the right information on what to do with it, it's null and void. So when, you, when, when she asks a question about vision, a lot of y'all walk around with perfect eyesight but don't have no vision. What's your vision in your subconscious? Is the subconscious vision or the unconscious vision that you have for yourself something that somebody else gave you? Media, which stands for multi-ethnic destruction in America. The only way I can destruct you is if I distract you. We distracted about Bentleys, and we don't know that we walk in Bentleys. We distracted by Bentleys when you got Bentley entitlement but Honda Civic stewardship. You want a Bentley, but you can't handle a Honda. You want a blue check on IG, but you can't handle somebody saying something negative on your page. Mm -hmm. It don't work like that. <laughs> Anybody up here who I, 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 except for the queen, we, we probably have seen millions of dollars. And I'll tell you this, money is not power. Because if you take a million dollars and turn it into seconds, it's only 12 days. If you take a billion dollars, though, and turn it into seconds, it's 32 years. See, this system, the establishment or whatever you want to call it, whoever controls your thinking has told you that you need to go be a millionaire. Mm -hmm. This system, instead of worrying about, you can go be a billionaire. Why, why, you, why would you put me in a box? This system told you to go buy a Land Rover, but no land. This system told you to go get a private jet when you should have been getting the airport. But if I put you in a box, then that's how I keep you in bondage. Mm -hmm. And that's how I keep you dormant. So what we're saying to you today is, first you got to have a vision. Because when you write something down, when you write your vision and goals and aspirations down, the prefix to the word authority is author. When you author something, you give it authority to come to pass. Now, when it comes, you better be ready for it. Excellent. And if, if I may judge, can I chime in? Uh, get ready. No, no, no. Oh, we're going to another thing. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Because the timekeeper is telling me we're running out of time. I have some topics that we are going to discuss. The panel is going to be brief. But I want to get through these topics. So I'm only going to give this one question to each person because I want to cover this, and then we're going to get questions from you. All right? Mr. Dorch, civil rights and legacy is important. We all watch the Super Bowl, and we watch our civil rights leader come out. What can you say to this generation? Why is civil rights important to anything that happens with legacy and leadership? Answer that for me, and everybody's going to get their own question, and then we'll get to you all. Well, first, I, I think civil rights, and, and you should understand history and not his story. Mm -hmm. The reason why we are where we are today, and I, it really disheartens me to hear a lot of younger people and younger professionals who really downplay and who really attack our leaders like living legends like Ambassador Andrew Young, Dr. C.T. Vivian, 94 years young. Without him, we would not have the Voting Rights Act. 
-hmm. Doc, uh, again, and you go through, you got Zanona Clayton, you got uh, Lowry. Joseph Lowry, and you can go on. These people gave of their time. Dr. King gave his life. And if it had not been for them, if they had taken a different approach and it was violence, masses would have been murdered and we'd still be where we are. The nonviolent movement, again, with the cameras, allowed the public to see the abuse and how they were beaten down. And so people of good mind and people of good cause uh, then began to speak up and speak out. Uh, and so the white community and other communities, and, and it's important, all people, we get in, and I say it, there are those of your color who are not of your kind. You take a Clarence Thomas, he, he definitely is not of our kind. <laughs> And, but there are those of our kind who are not of our color. So everybody black's not for you, and everybody white's not against you or, or Hispanic. But the civil rights leaders mm -hmm. sacrificed. Dr. King gave away all of his money from the Nobel Peace Prize. He gave it away. They grew up not making money, but they gave and they sacrificed. So it's important to understand the civil rights, civil rights then and why young people must take up the stance and, co and continue the movement now is that the more you get, the more people want to take it away. Mm -hmm. This is the most racist president I have mm -hmm. seen in the history mm -hmm. of this nation during my lifetime. Yeah. And his efforts is, call, is causing others to try and take away what we've gained. You've got to work hard to continue to maintain and get more. And folks, understand you got to take a stand. R real quick, Kaepernick took a knee because he felt something should have happened. And then the president and everybody in protest. But before him, the, um, this graduate of Florida State, Tim Tebow, took a knee to protest abortions. And everybody thought he was a hero. But he took a knee during the, right. during the, 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 the national anthem. But I'm, my charge to you, and then I'm going to get out of the way, is I want every one of you, I know you got phones, I want you to go on and I want you to Google third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner. I will never, ever, ever, ever sing the Star Spangled Banner. I will stand for the flag. I will defend my country. But the Star Spangled Banner was a song that was written in protest of slaves mm -hmm. exactly who came right. back, part of civil rights, exactly right. who came back to this country with British soldiers, because back during slavery, if you escaped from this country to Canada, Canada gave refuge, refuge to slaves. Over 6,000 got to Canada, but their families were left here in prison in slavery. And they wanted to come back, get their families, and take them to, back to Canada. And the British soldiers worked with them. It's history, not his story. We all talk that the British were against us. The British were against a bunch of crazy folks, but anyway, the reality is, they came back, the war at Fort McHenry, and on that night, uh, Francis Scott Key wrote mm -hmm. the balance of his Star Spangled Banner. The third stanza mm -hmm. is really an attack on slaves. Mm -hmm. It talks about their blood and celebrates killing slaves. Mm -hmm. And that is your national anthem, not mine, mm -hmm. because that was written in protest. And he was a slave owner. Mm -hmm. And when he That's became right. the DA in DC, he prosecuted and discriminated against so many people. So if you know your history, and the, by the way, the president called him whatever. He doesn't even know the words to the Star Spangled Banner. He was lip syncing. Is that right? So, but it was not until 1931 that Congress adopted the Star Spangled Banner as a national anthem. It was uh, five years ago they only started playing it mm -hmm. at the at the uh, at the game. So, so again, there's still a form of slavery that we still need to fight for civil rights. But we need to understand in this country. It is great because we made it. It is great because of the Andrew Youngs and those who fought for it. And for you young people, you have got to get engaged and get involved, mm -hmm. and you've got to make a difference. Bernie fooled a bunch of people, and young people didn't go vote. Mm -hmm. And when you didn't go vote and other folks didn't go vote, we got Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And don't be mad at Donald Trump. He ran. He told us what he was going to do. He told us what he was going to do. He was a crook. Mm -hmm. He stole part of the election, exactly right. and they said, well, well, white women, mostly white women, 53% voted. voted for him. Yeah. Top Fortune 4, 100 and 500 supported him. 
But at the end of the day, you know who his biggest supporters were? Fifty-one percent of black folks who could yeah. vote did not go out and vote. And yeah. so you help those that didn't vote. You have to put Donald Trump in. And so with that. We still need you to take up the mantle. We need you to still fight because they're trying to take away your rights in the state, take away your rights nationally, student loans and all of those things. They're trying to, because if we can enslave you, we control you. And so my, my, my issue is we need the next generation of civil rights leaders and we also need to understand silver rights because your money people will understand your buying power controls what happens. Exactly. Right. So I leave that with you, but still, the, the battle continues. Yeah. If you look at what you lost, we lost a major portion of middle class African Americans in this country with the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. And if it were not for President Obama, it wasn't Donald Trump, we're be just beginning to feel the effects exactly. mm -hmm. of what he did. Exactly. But he had one of the worst administrations in terms of financial, having to clean up All a financial this. mess. And it's gonna be worse now with two trillion more in debt, but Young people, you're the best and the brightest. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you gotta be in the streets, you yeah. gotta get involved. Mm -hmm. exactly. And if you don't vote, you don't count. And if you aren't counted, don't come complaining to us what you, about what you don't have. My, my, my. Come on, let's give him a round. You see why he's the chairman of the National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame. We're gonna take your questions. I'm always a believer that when you don't vote, you co-sign your own oppression. You want to be oppressed, don't vote. And nobody could have said it better than Mr. Dort. So at this time, what we're going to do is if a question is asked so that we can hear from each panelist, I'm going to ask that each one answer the question. And we're going to take about six questions before we go. How are we going to proceed with that? Do you have a mic? Yes? Just mine. Okay. Who has a question? Yes. Come on, line up over here. If you have a question, come on. Start lining up. Right here. Okay. Tell us your name and then ask the question. My name is Verna Hill, and I have a question about the issue of not voting. We vote in the communities, and African American. I'm an African-American woman, I'm heavy set, and I have a voice. When we encounter people who think that we should not talk, who we, sh we should not um, convey our issues in the public, in the black community, and our, vote our voting rights automatically seem like they're neglected around other black people. So what's your question? My question is, how do we tackle that issue in a black community if we vote we I, I vote i go and i apply for a job but another black person says well she don't look like she votes so we're not going to hire her how do we handle stuff like that because that is something that is really really going on in the african-american community well we're putting each other down every day okay one of you want to take that is, um, Thank you for that question. I think, um, I think, great question. I think that we got to start being a little bit more diligent. Mr. Dorch hit it on the head about not voting and all that. I think we, that needs to be a part of our conversation. In other words, when you're dating somebody, Someone. you know, when you ask them what kind of music they like, ask them if they're voting, if they're registered to vote. The MVP page, my voters page, will prove if they've been voting. So let's go, let's go, on, let's go online and look at your voter registration. You know, because first of all, there, there's, um, there's over 600,000 African Americans in the state of Georgia who's not registered to vote. That's ridiculous. So that means somebody in here who said, how many people registered to vote? Raise your hand. Somebody lying. <laughs> somebody lying. Because the numbers show that that's not true. Now, you all might be. I'm just kidding. But, but it shows that there's even more outside who's not. Yeah. You with me? Because the numbers show that over 600,000 African Americans did not, and then it, you start talking about the ones who didn't go to the polls. So I think we got to be real diligent about the conversations that we have. Like, you know, so you like, um, you know, you like this or you like that. Let me see your voter. Let's go online. I'm going to show you my voter. Let me and it tells you when last time you voted. Yep, it does. You with me? Because somebody's lying. And I'll say this and I'll quit. I hope if you, if you raise your hand and said you, you registered to vote and you vote, I hope you have four flat tires on the way home. <laughs> your spare tire is low and you're in Forsyth County with a pick in your head that says I'm ready to vote, because it's that serious. 
is that serious. And so yeah, we need a lot to of times do you don't vote because you don't think you're getting anything out of yeah. it. You don't think anybody's fighting for you. Sometimes when you're not doing something, you end up with a Donald Trump. Right. Exactly right. Exactly. We don't even have a Voting Rights Act now. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. In 2019. Exactly right. Do you understand that without that, it limits your future? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't give my power away that much. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, we might as well put some chains on you, put mm -hmm. you in a cotton field when you don't vote. That's mm -hmm. what it means. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, um, how do you think it's best as a black community that we move towards not only just voting in our politics, but also calling our senators? If you're not, um, if you're illegal immigrant, you can still call your senators. You can do other things in your community that will help um, your people. Someone, please answer. Civic engagement. How can you um, get involved? You know, for me, I. I recognize that we first have to see the whole overall big picture. And we always say the word community. And when I found out that we don't live in communities, that's when I was able to find out why we're in bondage. We, we live in, and when you look at a community, I'll take you to Disney World. They have their own education, they got their own police, they got their own money. <clears throat> and they control all of that ecosystem. We don't live in communities, we live in neighborhoods. And what do you do with a hood? I put it over your head to hide the truth on what's going on. And it's not until I unveil the truth and I get a 360 degree view, uh, overstanding is what I call it, of what's really going on, then I can get an understanding on how I can help my people within that ecosystem. So voting is great, but if you're voting and you're not taking care of your health, then what's that going to do? Voting is great, but if you're voting and you're not taking care of your credit score, then what is that going to do? Because the last time I checked, they ain't changed the, the laws on FICO system. Y'all know what the FICO means? It's a score that was created in 1956 by a white man and a Jew. And they named together creates FICO. And, we, and they will not teach you about FICO in elementary, middle school, high school, or college. But you need a FICO score for a job. You need FICO score for a house, a car, and lights, and everything else. So why would a system not tell you about FICO score, but they want you to be so liberated? That's what you got to have to understand. Answer to your question is voting is just stage one. Once you get people in, you got to hold them accountable, no matter what their color and who they are. And therefore, students ought to go down to City Hall, to the County Commission, go down to the General Assembly that's in, in, in right now, your school board, show up, ask your questions. As a voter, you have the right. And then if you're called to, for jury duty, go to jury duty because voters go to jury duty if you want justice. So the key is voting is the first phase. Once you get them in, you hold them accountable because if you elect them and then never, they never hear from you, they start thinking they're all, power, all powerful and they'll make their own decisions. But first is voting and then be activists to go in and ask the questions, show up and I would love to see this many people show up at a city hall meeting well, on issues about that may impact this college. Yeah. So you have the power, you just got to use it. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Come on up. How y'all doing? My name is Anthony DeBerry. Um, my question is, if the melanated move migrated to Africa was just a mass amount, how do you think our banking systems would be without being tied to the paganomic system. Mm. Say that one more time. Okay, the first line. What you just said? <laughs> I, hey, bro, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> Child, put the book down. Talk like you're talking to your mama. Bro, <clears throat> I'm with you, bro. What did you just say? I, I, I'm with you. The only person that understood you is Stevie Donner. <laughs> okay. and, 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 that, and, that's, and, that, and that's that's a problem. We when we when we think differently as a people we acute we we treat each other bad. No 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 no. And and, and with this brother answers no dumb question, my brother. Of course not. But I oh, want to let you like recognize. He wasn't it that way. No no he he might have though. We don't yeah. know that. Everybody don't have your godfidence. Yeah okay. You know and my godfidence, cause your opinion of me ain't none of my business. But he might have a different what, vibe with point. that. I just couldn't hear you. Okay, okay. I just couldn't hear you. So if the melanated or a mass amount moved to Africa. Okay, if we moved to Africa, gotcha. 
how do you think our banking system would be without being tied to the paganomic system? Got it. All right. We have it. Go ahead. You want that since you're banking? You take it. I would like... Can, so, so essentially, yeah, can, I'd like to say, I'd like to say something. Um, so when I, like last January, I studied abroad in Ghana for the first 18 days of January, phenomenal experience. I was reporting on the cocoa industry, which is like the heaviest import and export for that, for that region of Africa. Um, so when you talk about finances, that's really what I was researching. Um, and I was most mostly interested because here in America, we have this huge market for black soap and for cocoa products when we go to like African fairs and things like that. But we never know where these products are coming from. Children are making these things and they're being mailed in mass quantities over here. Shea Moisture has a monopoly over this product where there are villages in Ghana that don't get a, a penny of it. So to that point, I just want you to know I'm really well versed on the topic. And um, I was taking classes at the University of, University of Ghana at the time. So the professor that we had was asking us like how we felt about the United States banking system, just our financial situation period as brown people on ultimately what, on what is ultimately foreign soil. And so you have to you have to be very critical, like almost immediately, of the role we've played, our people have played when it comes to money, or just like our narratives or storylines when money has been involved. Um, I won't unpack all of it for the sake of time and just for the sake of a real w woman of money to be able to say her piece, but as somebody who trades in the foreign exchange market, like I trade in the foreign exchange market, and I would not have even been introduced to that opportunity to my first point that I said when the initial question was asked when I first spoke. I wouldn't have been introduced to that opportunity if I didn't research it for myself. So I would think that if we were to migrate back to Africa, we could possibly have access to more opportunities that are centered around the betterment of our community, but we have to seek them out. I'm a college student just like you guys. I have a vision, again, I forget what panelists mentioned, having 2020 vision or great eyesight but not having a vision for yourself. A lot of people will say a college student can't get a great, like can't get a good amount of income or at least figure out a way to maintain residual income while still being enrolled in an undergraduate institution. Um, Mr. Stevie, I don't know if he meant to, he immediately said, immediately said it was impossible for me to have seen millions of dollars. Now I haven't seen millions, but I've definitely seen a few thousand. I definitely know, <laughs> I definitely, I'll get, a, I know yes. I'll get around to it. I know I have, I, I, I know that I, I equip myself with the necessary knowledge to be able to, to I, I had to hide in my stakes ultimately. So when I say hiding your stakes, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and you have to start your own business or you have to go out and, and, and have risk in, in, this, in this global market that we're a part of. But to some degree, you, you, want, you want what's happening in the world to impact you. That's to your the SGA president's question about how we increase voting power. People, how do we get people to care more about voting? Voting power is linked to buying power. You want to, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of agency. It's a matter of feeling like you belong or you're actually contributing to the society, that you're a moving piece and a moving, a, a, a maker in the society. If you don't take that upon your, if you don't take it upon yourself to figure out how you can deepen your, your, your role in society, then it kind of will just go over your head. Thank you. I think what made the question so good is that once I heard it and you were saying, you were really expressing the incredible buying power that we as black and brown people have, particularly with a system that we did not create. And so to the extent we move this, our buying power, out of America, what would happen? It would collapse. That's how we answered that question. Thank you. Bottom line. Bottom, bottom line, though, is let me let's let's also be real. It will never That's, happen. There are more billionaires and black billionaires in Nigeria, there. several times over than in this country. There are more billionaires in Africa than in this country. We are more of a workforce economic investors. We spend. So we are the foundation. There, um, a book, if you can read it, by um, uh, it's called How the, uh, How the um, Poor Can Save Capitalism. That John Bryan, yeah. you should read that book. We work in this nation and we spend. We show up this nation's economy. Two trillion dollars a year we earn. Our brown sisters and brothers earn about one to 1.3 trillion dollars. But it's not going anywhere. You got to work and make money somewhere. And in Africa, our brothers and sisters don't need us. We're coming there dependent. 
So think about it, it's a good philosophical question, but the reality is we're not going to Africa. They don't want us coming if we don't bring something to the table. And in this country, if we collectively pull our monies together, instead of being people who spend and we invest with each other and use that, we can change this country. We don't have to have eventually just voting, but our economic systems we don't use. So the reality is we got two trillion and we spend it and everybody else uses it to make their That's successes. It. One thing that I liked about what Stevie said is he's saying that you allow the consciousness, your consciousness to be dictated by the oppressor. And so what we're saying is if you get money, what's the first thing you do with it? You spend it, but if you really wanted to accumulate wealth, what would you do? Right, but if the first thing you do, you win the lottery, I give you a million dollars right now, what would you do with it? Spend it. That's a consciousness, everybody doesn't think that way. If I gave Mr. Dorch a million dollars, Mr. Dorch would not spend it, right? Steve, if I gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it? Invest it, right? Because you spend it, will you ever get it back again? It's a consciousness. And what they're trying to tell you is you develop that consciousness about all those things. So you're right about what you just said. What's your question? Because we're wrapping up on time. The last. Come on. How everybody doing? First, I want to say thank you all for sharing your knowledge with us. My name is Diamond Blaine. I'm 22. Um, What's your question, baby? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was tacked behind my question, but to make it short, what advice would you give us to make an effective change? With us being the millennium generation, it's a lot that we have to deal with. It's a lot that we're putting up against. So what advice would you give us to help make an effective change? Judge Hatchet? Yeah, um, I, I, I just know that we have to be authentic. We have to know who we are, to whom we belong, and be very clear. Not chameleons, where we change every time something happens, but be very intentional about who we are and how we do things. And y'all, we got to support and love each other. John Stanford was one of my dearest friends who passed on several years ago after a brilliant battle with cancer. And he would say, you can't lead them unless you love them. You can't lead them unless you love them. And what we have to do is remember how we love each other. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood as a child where it didn't matter whose mama or daddy saw you doing something wrong. You know, they get you, get you, tear your butt up, and then get you home, and then your mom and dad say, why are you out here embarrassing me? And so that, that community, that love, that it's not just my biological children, I have to claim all of you as my children. And until we start to do better about loving ourselves, we can't save anybody else. And we have got to be clear. And so when we look at each other as young black women, and I'm gonna make this short, as young black women, we have, you know, we can't say, we can't look at your hair. We got to look at your heart. And we can't be looking at your nails. We got to look at your knees. We can't look at what kind of shoes you got on. We got to see what kind of path you're walking. And I mean that seriously. I mean that. And we got to stop tearing each other down. And we got to look for the good in each other and celebrate it. You know, Judge Penny spent her whole time introducing me in the, introducing herself in the conference room talking about me <laughs> and how much she loved me. You know, and so we have got to celebrate the greatness. Not be gossiping and talking about, you know, that brother dropped out of school. What are we doing to help him get back in school? How are we going to uplift him? You don't know what burdens folk are bringing to these classrooms. Have you stopped today and said, hey, how you doing? And listen, and listen to the <laughs> answer. And so I'm just saying that until we are clear about who we are and these magnificent gifts that we are to the world, then we can't really come together. A point of privilege, my brilliant niece is back here on the wall. Uh, who is on the faculty over at Atlanta Technical College, Dream Pen, Dr. Dream Pen, so glad to see you. 
And y'all take advantage of Dr. McMillan being on this campus. I didn't realize he was a scholar in residence. Mr. President, I, Dr. McMillan, I need to get the class schedule. I need to come and sit at your feet to learn. And if he is here, take advantage of it. He was the first person, this last thing I'm say, he was the first person. My dad died suddenly 25 years ago when I finished take, making arrangements and getting back to my mom and daddy's house. He was the first person at my mom and daddy's house. And so I thank you, Dr. McMillan, for what you've meant to my family over the years and what a blessing you have been in this community. I thank you and I celebrate you. We're going to move quickly with these last two persons. What's your question? Um, my question is just, as a young person with like tattoos, piercings, I'm a young black woman, and I just want to know how I can present myself to people like higher up in a manner that won't let them sh like push me away or not take me seriously. Like, how can I present myself so that I can be taken seriously? <coughs> so I'll take that one. One of my biggest battles, and it's not evidence of today, but when I first decided to wear my afro in the bank, okay? So, and that wasn't that long ago. It was probably only four years ago. And don't have perms, just have natural long hair. So it was big. And I was called Diana Ross all day. I was like, you look like, who do you look like? Somebody, somebody. Her, her. Uh, she's on, Tracy, no, her mom. That. So people will tell you in life that you're not your hair, you're not your skin, you're not your tattoos. Yes, you are. And I'm going to tell you right now, yes, you are. But it's how you embrace those things. Do you lack confidence because you have a tattoo? Do you lack confidence because you have a nose piercing? Do you have confidence when you're walking in rocking your afro? Right? But we have to remember that our image is us too. And if we want to sell ourselves, and I don't say that lightly because when you work for somebody else, you sold yourself per hour or per year, okay? When you want to sell yourselves, you have to align, right? You don't have to sell yourself out, but you have to align to image standards that align with the mission of that company of what they're trying to obtain in it here. It doesn't mean you can't have tattoos. It doesn't mean you can't have nose piercing. It doesn't mean you can't rock your fro, right? Because I do those things. But we do have to realize that that is part of who we are because part of who we are is the perception that people have of us. What we do with that information is up to us. But if we can't get past the front door, then that's something that we have to analyze. And you have to decide what do you want and do your behaviors and do your image allow you to have the opportunity so then you can show them who you really are, right? When I interviewed with the bank, I flat ironed it, right? And when I got there, I let it puff out and they're like, dang, she got us, <laughs> right? But it was too late, I was already in. You can't fire me because I wore an afro. I didn't see that in the handbook, right? But then I was able to express my talents and skill sets. So how are you putting yourself in a position to express your talents and skill sets? And just real short, I heard a thing about hiring practices. I've never heard of someone hiring you because you don't vote. I've never heard of that. Um, because they can't even ask you that in a hiring interview. That's, you know, that's a different topic. But what did you look like? What did you sound like when you walked in the door? Were you on time? Right? Did you put on makeup or not? Did you put on a little lip gloss? Did, did you do it? Right? What did you look like? What did your skill set say? We like to say we're black and we're missing the opportunities. You can't use black as an, as an excuse for where you're falling short to live up to your own potential. That's excellent. I would also That's excellent. add, I have to add like two more, one more sentence to that. We have to be very clear and intentional about whether we're going to be victorious or whether we're going to be victims. And if you go in with the spirit of being defeated, oh, I am disadvantaged done. because I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. You have to go in with a spirit of being victorious and being prepared and not fall on the excuse, oh, they didn't do it because I'm a black woman. No, you are a badass and you need to go in there fully prepared and get it done. I want to also add to, um, to Judge Hatchett's point about whether we're going to be victorious or victims. I'll say that deciding, like 
sorting out what would make us a victim is a painful experience. And what I mean when I say that, I think this is what I was trying to get to when I mentioned my financial fortitude piece earlier. It's just that for me, to become financially fortitude by me taking it upon myself to become a black woman that's well-versed in the foreign exchange market, to know the words, to know the language, to participate in the activity, is very contra to my, my own mother's and her own mother's and her mother's mother's experience with finances. Money was a taboo topic in my household. Money is a difficult topic in a lot of black households. I don't know what it's like, what, what the difficult topics are in your household, but Becoming victorious as opposed to becoming a victim is being able to look at those things dead in its face and not shy away from it or be scared of it. Run directly at it. I, I'm able to have conversations with my mother about the money that I make in the foreign exchange market. I'm teaching her and my entire family how to make money in the foreign exchange market. I'm funding my business with the foreign exchange market. Something that she couldn't have even seen for herself five or ten years back or even for herself at the age of 21. So you have to look at those things. It's very painful. I'm going to be very real with you. It's very painful. Thank but it's, it's great. It's great. Thank you. I want you all to get these scholarships before you go. So let's come on. We have one more question. What is that? Um, I'm um, Haitian, basically. So I, my question is just... How can immigrants basically impact you know, the, the, the society in which we, we live in when we can you know, our, our, our have access to vote and can only basically stay in the country while we're in college? Who wants to take that? Where are you from? Haiti. My father, he's from Gambia. My name is Anta. I say it as Anta because that's how Americans can pronounce it. I will say that despite, your, like, if even if the, the right to vote is something that isn't accessible, you all being able to spread your experiences by way of dialogue is just as important. Being in this space, you being a, a, someone in this room and you're from Haiti, you can speak about your homeland, your culture, the things that you all have to offer, why it's important to allow more Haitians onto the land. Um, I hate the fact that you can't vote, though. I know I've, I've, again, going back to that painful, the pain the pain of having to reflect. I had to write several grievancy statements on behalf of my father to the immigration office in order for him to stay. I believe he didn't get his right to vote until he was 37. It's difficult, but you just remain assiduous and hardworking, and it'll, it'll pay off. And be the change that you want. Ça passe. Let's thank this incredible panel. They spoken life into you. They spoke life into you. You received that life. We close by letting you know if nobody told you that you are enough, you are enough because you are here, you are enough because you are created. Let us thank Mr. Tommy Dorch. Now get ready for your scholarships, come on. Come on now, you act like you're happy about it. But do me a favor and let's stand and salute uh, Judge Penny Brown Reynolds and thank her for a phenomenal job. Now we got, got some treats for you, but to my brother from Haiti, you've got to help people understand the Haitian history and impact on this country and on this country for, us, for our freedom. There's not another country that had some of the most fearless fighting individuals that created some of the greatest armies in the world and instead of being saluted and celebrated, they were persecuted. And so if you know the history of Haiti and even in, in, in New Orleans and all, then we would all be saluting you and, and, and your country for all that you did. But that's why I know, know ye the truth and the truth will set you free. So, so um, unfortunately, our Haitian brothers and sisters have been persecuted when they shouldn't have been. Exactly right. But they are the reason why, another part of the reason why we enjoy the kinds of freedom in this country. Because when Napoleon and his group came in, they conquered everybody. But when those Haitian brothers got out there, they kicked butt. So let's make sure you do your own research about, about our, our, our brothers and sisters from, from our neighborhoods. And the late Johnny Cochran said we all came on the same boat. But there were brothers who got off in Haiti and the Bahamas said, I'm not going to America and be a slave. And they started their own thing in the country, but we all came from that same beginning. So let me get some money. First, on the front row, look under your seat. Look under your seat. Look under your seat. See if you see anything tagged under your seat on the front row. That one doesn't count if you're not. Look under your seat. You find anything under your seat. Come up. 
Find anything under your seat. Come on up. Anybody else? All right, let me tell you what we do. We always do a front row scholarship because people, people, and we're going to get through this one second. When you sit and when you come to the room, you always should try to come to the front. You want to see and be seen. We don't need to go to the back. We fought to get you out of the back of the bus and all that. And you go in the back, come to the front row. These two individuals will get $100 a piece because they got, they sat on the front row and they sat in the right seat. So if you'll give them your name over there, she'll take care of you on your, on your $100 book scholarship for sitting on the front row. Always go to the front, don't sit in the back. Um, we're gonna do a drawing now. Um, you want me to start with the big scholarship and work down or start with the smallest and work up? All right, those that want me to start with the smallest and work up, raise your hand. You want suspense. All right, let them down. Those that want me to start with the 500 and work down, raise your hand. All right, so you want me to start with this? We're going to do 12 $25 uh, book scholarship. I hope it was $25 to buy a book. We wanted to buy a used book, but <laughs> my day, that bought me about two or three books when I was at Fort Valley. Um, so what we're going to do, let me ask, um, I won't do it to your SGA president because you'd be mad at him if I had him draw. So let me ask again our queen if she'll come and draw these. See, if I put the president on the spot, you'll be talking about, why didn't you pull my name? And then he's an SGA president. He was just saying that he was trying to give an equal opportunity. So first $25 will go to this ticket. And ticket number, I'm going to give you the last three, 512. 512. 512 going once. We got it. Come on up. And just verify the tickets she's bringing. 512. All right. Uh, and one other note. At the table outside are applications for the Andrew Young Emerging Leaders Institute. We bring in student leaders from across the country every summer, hosted by Ambassador Andrew Young. We have some uh, phenomenal people. Judge Glenda Hatchett closes it out every year, and the folks on the panel you see are part of that, and we have any number of folks who are involved, Dr. C.T. Vivian, but it is a two and a half day leadership training institute. Fill out your applications if you're interested. And we'd love to have um, some of you participate. You'll be with students from around the country, from HBCUs who will be in the institute. All right, next drawing, next number. Don't forget the applications on the table out, out back. Uh, six, four, eight. Is that a nine? <laughs> six, four, eight. Six, four, eight going once. And you're a student. Come on up here and get this. This is one of our. This is one of our. This is one of our participants in our in our leadership roundtable this morning. And phenomenal contribution. And see, see what you did. There you go. So go ahead and check with them right over there. Next, that's two. I got ten to go. I'll move real quick now. Here we go. The number is five nine five five nine five. Five nine five once, five nine five twice. Moving on. The number is five two three. Five two three once, five two three twice. Gone. The next number is five five four. Five five four. Five. Five five four. Once. Twice, gone. Somebody don't want money. Um, Could have bought a sandwich with it. Uh, 498, 498, 498, come on up. You gonna pull another one? Next number is 450, 450. Tell me when I've given away all 12. I'll maybe give more. Next number, 533. Yeah. All right, front row, 533. Yeah, 
These are the winning ones. You can get those. Next number is 588. 588. There we go. And Meryl, where am I on the count? 442. 442. There we go. I said, how many? Keep going. Next number is 630. 630. Now we got a 630. She'll take you right there. 508, 508, 508, 508 once, 508 twice. Moving on. 473, 473. There we go. Here you go, Hassan. Hassan, here we go. 518, 518. I got two more to go before I get to the big ones. 628. 628. 628. All right. This is the last one for the $25. And that's 549. 549. All right. There we go. That's it, right? That's it. She got you right there, so that, that that takes care of the 25. Okay. So next is, one, what, what's the next, 100 I'll or 200? I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, we got 100. Okay. All right, the next three going will go 100, then the next will be 300, and the final will be $500. All right, this is for $100. It goes to 736. <laughs> this one this one is for the 300 the 300 goes to 732 732 alright folks this is the last one this is for 5 Hundred dollars. Shaking it good. Shaking it good. Five hundred dollars. The number is seven. Five. Hey, how you doing today? <laughs> Five. Seven, five, five. <laughs> okay. Now, my other question, my other question is we, we're getting, don't forget again, Fill out the applications if you want to be considered for the Andrew Young Emerging Leaders Institute. If you go to the website for the, for those of you that want to apply for scholarships, they don't worry, they, they're not listening. The National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame Foundation, nbcahof.org, there are scholarship applications on that website. Uh, that you can qualify for. Is anybody in here that majors in any hospitality degree program? And, all right, listen up for those who, those who are interested in scholarships. N-B-C-A-H-O-F dot org. There's a section on scholarships, scholarship application. You can apply for scholarships there at the National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame Foundation. In addition, anybody in here majoring in hospitality or culinary arts? Every March we do what is called Chefs of the World, A Taste of Fame. 
Those scholarships are earmarked for any student who majors in hospitality or in culinary arts. There is an application you can apply uh, for that scholarship. The unfortunate thing for us, we've had plenty of scholarships and individuals have not applied for them. Now your neighbors across the street at Atlanta Technical College usually has at least 10 students who get scholarships every year because they apply for them. So let me again thank Dr. Magaha for uh, inviting us to, to come and the student leadership, our SGA president. But I want to thank all of you for coming and staying. Um, some of the panelists will be around if you want to talk to them for a few minutes. But we will be back next year when um, we get with, uh, with Dr. Magaha and look for dates. But we appreciate all of you and just know this is a phenomenal college. It is great because of the students who have come through and the students that are here. If you just look at the statistics on what is being achieved here, the graduation rates and everything, you're outpacing every college and university in the university system, including Georgia State, the University of Georgia, and Georgia Tech. That is phenomenal. Don't downgrade, uh, don't, don't discount the great education you're getting here. And so we're happy you're here. If it were not for this institution, my nephews who came through here would not be successful in doing the things that they are doing today. It was because this great college prepared them coming from a small city. They had scholarships from the Hope Scholarship, but they came here because it helped them to adjust coming from a small city to be prepared for what was out there for them. You're in a great place. Make the best of it because what you do will really shine well on the future of this great college. Thank you for coming out today. I want to also say to anybody who was interested um, about the things I was mentioning about trading in the foreign exchange market and financial fortitude, I'm a part of an invest. I don't trade independently. I trade with an investment group called Trade House Investment Group. It's branched out of Morehouse, but it has 3,000 members and it is across states. If you're interested, I have information on hand and would love to spread it to you, okay? <laughs>